I'm so excited that today we honor Narep. A few years ago, I think in 2017 maybe, yeah. Rick asked me to present on the upscale Latino market. And uh, when I did the research, I found a lot of great information from the National Association of Realtors. And the fact that so many Latinos come from all over Latin America, many of them from Mexico, and buy homes with cash, many of them. And uh, some of them are just regular homes, some of them are more upscale homes in Texas, in many other places. And, uh, and then I also, in my research for that, I found NAREP. And I loved when I saw the NAREP 10, 10 disciplines for creating wealth, uh, equity in, in the Latino community. And let's focus on net worth, not so much on income. And um, the, I, I share the 10, be politically savvy, be spiritually healthy, physically healthy. Uh, think of family. I mean, those are wonderful things. And I think I'm so glad that we have an AREP in town. At the time, I remember announcing, we don't have, a, I didn't see a local chapter anywhere. And uh, now we do. So this is a huge thing for the Latino community that we have a local NARET chapter here. I love it. And uh, moving on with this, and what can I say? What can I say that hasn't been said? Marketing challenges in the age of DEI. And this is not the Agnus Day of the Lamb of God. This is a day, a different kind of day. So I think, uh, uh, you know what, let's, let's talk about him as long as he left. Uh, I need to start quoting our esteemed guest. Uh, two years ago, almost to the date, he wrote this article, Jose Villa. He wrote this article about the end of multicultural marketing. Look at him. Look at him smiling as he proclaims the end of multicultural marketing. Is he coming back? I, I'm glad I'm just talking about him behind his back. So little did he know that uh, I'm sure Rick saw this when I saw it too, two years ago. And Rick moved to action immediately and summoned him to come to Minnesota to the his to the Multicultural Marketing yes. Conference to explain himself. <laughs> Look, with a smile, he proclaims the end of multicultural marketing. So now he's here at the Multicultural Marketing Conference. Actually, he doesn't proclaim it. It's a question mark in there. That kind of uh, helps a little bit. So that's uh, what happened. And I also jumped to action when I saw the article and I stole the image. Look at it, it's beautiful. I love it, this is great, it's a nice thing. And that's what we're here for. We're here to learn on, uh, about how to reach effectively hard to reach market segments. That's what we're talking about and that is really what uh, um, multicultural usually means, ethnic, racial, specific markets, except now, Jose points correctly that uh, the U.S. is becoming a plurality. There's no single market that is a majority, and so the fact that minor, minor, there's no minority if there's no majority, there are pluralities, different groups. These demographic changes make uh, uh, multicultural marketing uh, uh, the, correct, the incorrect term. It's semantics, but it's not the right term in some ways. And uh, we can call it, and some people call it cultural marketing. We can just call it marketing, marketing in a, plur in a plurality uh, state, in a sense. So in the past few years in this conference, we showed population trends, including, for example, uh, about uh, mixed unions. You know, we can't even say interracial marriage because there are not two races. Sometimes there are four races represented in, in the two people that get married. And many people are not getting married anyway. So there are mixed unions. And so we do have a biracial, a mixed race situation and a growing fusion cultural mix. That is uh, very well put. That is the reality we have today. We cannot see, you know, it's too simplistic to say we're going to use the traditional racial and ethnic lines that we've used in the past for segmentation. And as I reread re the article, I found this great quote, and this is really uh, what the introduction to what I want to say today, because companies with multicultural marketing groups and diversity and inclusion departments increasingly out of sync with the realities of the markets they purport to serve. That is happening, and uh, let's see how that's happening. Two initials, DEI, ERG. 
Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, also known as DNI, Diversity and Inclusion. That's big in companies. A lot of investment is going there in many corporations, large and small. And ERGs, we have, we are blessed in this town to have more than our fair share of Fortune 1000 headquarters. Many of them have employee resource groups. And uh, they, uh, we go to networking events and there they are, you know, people from 3M, from Cargill, from Target, from uh, uh, Medtronic, uh, all these companies, General Mills. So usually that is an HR function. And uh, which is true, it's usually uh, an HR function, except that uh, there's been a, a shift and in some ways a confusion. But one thing is certain that DEI is not multicultural marketing or any other version of marketing. It has its place and uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about it. A few years ago, actually, yeah, very recently, uh, somebody I know, somebody from our community, our Latino professional community in this town, many, many thousands of people, a lot of MBAs. We used to have a very active Latino MBA group, Prospanica now, and uh, many other chambers of commerce, many other professional networking groups. I had one myself at Babalu. I'm, I'm dating myself because Babalu closed, what, 10 years ago? I don't know when <laughs> closed. But we used to have great events. In fact, I have the dubious distinction of having organized the very first speed networking event, Latino speed networking event at Babalu. I always tell people, you bring at least 20 business cards. I challenge you in the community to, show, to catch me without business cards in my pocket. You need to do that. Bring business cards. You know how many times I would run into networking events, run into people who, oh yeah, I, run, I don't have any business cards on me. It's like, you came to a networking event, you know, bring. <laughs> So the requirement was, if you, have, if you can show me you have 20 business cards, and I told them this ahead of time, I send them the reminders. If you want to participate in this speed networking event, I need to see that you have at least 20 business cards because you're going to meet 20 other people. And we set the whole thing up. It was great. It was really had a lot of fun. And uh, so we have all this great uh, um, collection of very highly educated business people and others, technical people, engineers. We have a Hispanic professional engineer group. And um, one of them got a job in marketing in our, in our organization, not too large, but it was a decent sized organization. And so she said, oh, let's get together. I want to, I want to, to you know, the, um, my job is to find all these markets, including the Hispanic market, but to really do outreach and do marketing to the group. So we get together. And uh, so she's excited about this job. She's fluent in Spanish and uh, has a degree in marketing. And as we talk, I, I ask her, well, so, so what's your budget, you know, for marketing? Uh, and she says, well, you know, my organization's marketing budget is exactly my salary. <laughs> so that's it. This is the budget. We hire somebody to do marketing. And she needs to do marketing without a budget. She had no budget. She was trying to do organic, social, and, uh, you know, trying to learn from HubSpot about some I need to do some uh, inbound, inbound marketing, write some articles, and hopefully somebody will read it. And then, you know, I, a few years ago, I, when I presented on the, the BS of influencer marketing, well, all those, <laughs> that, that concept was there because uh, she was just, you know, struggling. She had no budgets. Now, show of hands, how many of you think that that organization had an, a DEI initiative? Every, yes, you betcha. They had a director of diversity and inclusion who had a budget. What's wrong with this picture? You know, I mean, what's wrong? And so that's what's happening. That is what's happening. And I think we need to do this presentation taking on the road, you know, the, the fun, you know, we'll change the title. The fun marketing. Uh, <laughs> Show, uh, show uh, road, road show. This is total market all over again. I don't know if you remember, again, a couple of years ago, I actually had a little section in a presentation where I talk about the total market fiasco and what happened with total market, which defunded Hispanic marketing among many other uh, marketing uh, uh, to minorities uh, budgets. So, 
This is a quote from one of our friends, one of our, somebody who's friends with, uh, with Rick Aguilar and uh, with the conference, Daisy. She says, total market will soon be remembered as the ad cell of marketing. What if, what if, I, if we think that maybe those first two words replace the first two words here with DEI? No, DEI, well, no, it's not, DEI is supposed to be organizational and it's HR and blah, blah, blah. But it's affecting marketing. We see how it affects marketing. We've seen in organizations, large ones even, and Rick alluded to one of them, where they have somebody and they have a department of multicultural marketing, and then they become the inclusivity department, or the, the diversity and inclusion, or the diversity initiative. And uh, I won't even get into why that is wrong, you know, put, put in initiative before inclusion is like putting the cart before the horse. So let's um, uh, not, not talk about that. Here is one way in which DEI can lead us in the wrong way. There are many ways, but just being Hispanic or black or whatever ethnicity doesn't mean that the person is an expert in marketing to those segments. And may not even be a good representative. Like, how many times have you heard, hey, we're not the market? We're doing Hispanic marketing, we're not the market. Go to most of the large, good ad agencies around the country, California and Miami, in New York, in, uh, they, I think there's one in Chicago now, right? In Texas, there are several. Those people are doing Hispanic marketing. They're not the market. Look at them, they're the creatives and all the people doing the work, they are advertising executives, the same thing here in Minneapolis, you know, all the great agencies we have. So, but that is, the, that is a fallacy that happens with DEI. Oh, oh, we got our Hispanic employee group and uh, our, our African-American employee group, so yeah, we'll do a little focus group and, and understand the market. In our community here in town, Rick and I go back 25 years because I, I was a full paying attendee at the very first Hispanic <laughs> marketing conference. And I, th I don't think I paid ever since. <laughs> yeah, I usually present, so you know. But we met many characters over the years uh, in, in, in any community and in this community here, the Latino community, professional, Lati la the professional Latino. Uh, uh, professional class in Minneapolis, in Minnesota, and in St. Paul, many of them would claim to be the experts in Hispanic marketing. Oh, I can deliver the market for you, and people hire them and give them money. We look at each other and we say, uh -uh, we know they're not experts, they're not Hispanic professionals, they're professional Hispanics. And we have that, and any community has that. Oh, is it? What is the, the, the main thing they offer? Oh, they are Latino. So therefore, they are an uh, expert in Latino issues. So uh, a lot of the people who fit this profile in any ethnicity tend to gravitate to DEI these days. They naturally gravitate to the DEI space. And you see, I've, I've met, I know some people who would, would qualify there. They work uh, for some of the large companies and medium-sized companies in the DEI space because they are of some ethnicity or race and therefore they qualify and, and there they are being ineffective trying to do something. Another pitfall, DEI equals not insights. Your Hispanic or black or Asian employees may represent the market, maybe demographically, but very likely, like we said, not, not psychographically, not in any other cultural measure, lifestyle measure. So we need to do research, think of it. A company does research, qualitative, quantitative, focus groups, various things with white people for the work they do, but they have a lot of white employees. Why don't they just ask their white employees? You know, why, why do research? if they have a lot of light white employees. Maybe that's a specialty now. <laughs> imagine this, imagine this, and I think I have a prop. I have a prop for you here. Maybe I'll do this too. Let's see, let the camera work on the angle. Because he's, he's, he's zooming, he's zooming in on me, maybe, maybe. Yeah. Sure, yeah, he's, uh, he's zooming in on me. Yes. I'm an expert in white people marketing. <laughs>
white people like weak coffee. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and if you question that, ask a barista to make you an Americano and watch what they do. Huh? Yes. I got the, the white people insights. True story from the trenches of white people marketing. A Latino family goes to dinner to a white people family. After dinner, they leave and they got tested for COVID because they couldn't taste anything. <laughs> Did I say that? I didn't say that. So, what, what is the relationship between DEI and marketing? And here's another leader that we need to follow. And if you've seen my presentation before, I follow this fellow. And uh, you want to follow them too, because this, this guy is uh, one of the key leaders in marketing today, uh, global branding. And uh, he's, uh, this is how they apply it. Of course, they spend a lot of money in marketing. See, this is an example of using the concept of DEI in marketing. The representation on the screen, behind the screen, equality everywhere, representation everywhere. And the main voices about that is, OK, representation on the screen is good. Let's look beyond the screen. Look at the screen, people like, for example, the Super Bowl ads, you know, Super Bowl ads and other advertising campaigns. A lot of people look at, okay, what's the representation? Oh, there was only, there were no Latinos, there was one potential Afro-Latino, and that was it, you know, and, or whatever. It's like, okay, fine, look at the screen, but look beyond the screen, behind the screen, look behind the camera. What is, what is the, uh, the ethnic, and, and racial mix and inclusivity mix of the writers, the content creators, the directors, the production teams. That is what a lot of companies are doing, which is good, including Procter & Gamble, PNG, one of the leaders. They also actually did something online, a whole new campaign. You can look it up online. It's called Widen the Screen, that kind of concept also. Cultural literacy and cultural competence. This is what this this concept here of uh, Nancy Tellet, a researcher with uh, with uh, AHA slash MCM slash HCM, monocultural feedback loop. Very interesting concept. You can Google that and find all kinds of information. But it's basically cultural literacy, which is comes from experience and preparation. Cultural literacy. And uh, cultural competence is actually something that we can work on, all of us can work on, and we need to continue to work on. I think the real estate profession, including uh, through NAREP, is doing great things to advance their cultural competence of real estate agents and the whole profession. So more than half of people ages 13 to uh, 49 have quit a culturally illiterate brand, saying it offended them or disrespected their values, this is something that happens, and uh, the cultural competence is what takes care, takes care of that. You know, you know, we need to be culturally competent in the communications that we, we generate. Even young Hispanics, and actually, when you look at the research of, of young Hispanics, Gen Z, and uh, young people, they increasingly wa uh, claim that their ethnicity, their identity is more important than before. And even U.S. born, English dominant Hispanics, young Hispanics, today more than before, and uh, say that yes, the, the Spanish culture and the, the Latino culture and the Spanish language, they're English dominant. The Spanish language is important to them. And it's more so today than if you were to do the research 2015, 2010. It's, it's growing. People identify more with their, their cultures, where they come from. So another fellow to follow, Mark Ritson. Uh, he's from England. He taught here in uh, the University of Minnesota, Carlson School of Management at the MBA. He taught in Sydney. He's back in the UK now. He's the one I quoted quite a bit in that one presentation that went really well uh, on, on the BS of influencer marketing, that I talk about influenza 
um, uh, pandemic because it was uh, people were using it too much. In, in fact, PNG came in very strong, saying this is fraud. That's what it's called when when you see the abuses that were going on early on in influencer marketing. But he actually and many others. There are many people taking a look at what a brand says and increasingly comparing the talk with the walk. And in this case, representation on the boardroom or in management or just supervisory employees, people who are not line employees, and many of them fail that test. You know, they say, oh, we appreciate, but if you look at, for example, Latinos or African-American employees, they are all at the lower levels of pay in the organization. And so that doesn't speak very well uh, to, to what they are um, saying in all this great, great uh, advertising. Here's one thing Walmart does. They have the creative review board. Minority or ethnic employees, diverse employees in the marketing department rotate and uh, they are part of this creative review to ensure the, that unconscious bias of the, in the creative process is in, is in playing out. That's what the CEO says. And uh, I couldn't find uh, any quotes or anything from the C, uh, or CMO, I mean. And uh, in a professional way, a much more professional, the, national, the Association of National Advertisers has a great initiative, the Alliance for Inclusive and Multicultural Marketing. It's an industry-wide industry uh, collective and for marketing. And our friend Carlos Santiago, another friend of the conference, is, is a co-founder of AIM. And he's part of this service, the Cultural Insights Impact Measure. This is a more scientific and effective way than, than asking your employees about uh, uh, checking to see how your communications, if you are into content creation, your programming, your, uh, what you're doing, how it resonates with the various communities. According to what they say, only 60% of all <laughs> marketers who, who think they're doing a good job, only 16% are doing it uh, effectively. So uh, these are cultural drivers, inclusion, respect, values, pride, portrayal, role models, celebration. They look at many aspects of that. And I think that is something we can learn, uh, either hiring them, they're not cheap, but also doing it ourselves, doing our own check. Uh, I used to have a service called Ethnic uh, value checking and uh, it was something like that. It's basically, hmm, how would this resonate? A lot of times with clients, if, I, if I'm doing work as a creative director or copywriter for an ad agency, I, I want to be and, manu and more increasingly more early in the process when they are developing a concept, not when it's all done, here, translate this. You know, I don't do translations. But when early in the process, they may come up with maybe three concepts. And as I evaluate it, and I engage other people often, we say, well, one of them really wouldn't fly. They would be really hard to execute for Latinos in Spanish, or you're playing with words in English, it doesn't work in Spanish. These other two, and this one, in one of them you're playing with words, but it really works in Spanish. So then they go and present those two concepts to the client because they know those concepts are, are better, more trans transferable. They will travel across cultures and language uh, easier than the other concept that was a little more uh, culture specific. Uh, so diversity of thought, this is the, what we need to look for. What DEI has done for your marketing, uh, what, what has DEI done for your marketing lately? Think of your marketing team. The best thing that happens, people inside the company, outside, who do you hire, who are the vendors? And we want diversity of thought, opinion, experiences, perspective, cognition. Uh, if you were to Google cognitive diversity in marketing or neurodiversity, all those things are happening. And, and, and it's incredible how uh, this kind of inclusion that goes way beyond race, gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, disability, the classic HR checkboxes, going beyond that in marketing as we look at, at inclusion and diversity, 
that really gives us, helps us get the best thinking around any challenge, around you know, looking for solutions. So, getting ideas from inside the company, from outside, and uh, what is the, the relationship that we want to use here? Our friend Daisy will help us solve this math equation. While Dee and I and marketing influence each other, one cannot substitute the other. Corporations need both. Brands need both. And they need to invest in both properly to be successful. There you have it. DEI plus marketing. Defund marketing at your own risk. The last word, Jose Villa. Jose Ramon Villa. New cultural marketing models are already emerging, such as cross-cultural, polycultural marketing. You know, there are many words floating around, and this is from two years ago. So while it may feel like desperate times, it is in fact a great time to be a cultural marketer. And it is a great time to be a cultural marketer and to be in the multicultural uh, conference, but really doing this incredible level of marketing in a very shifting uh, marketplace. Thank you. Oh,